Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending our fourth session, Advocacy for Animals Used in Research and Companion Animals. Uh, I'm one of the research scientists at Phonolytics, and I'm excited to present the first speaker of this session, Adam Cardellini from Deakin University, who's going to be discussing transparency in the animal research industry. Take it away, Adam. Thanks, folks. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, so, and I'm sorry if I'm not as sharp as I usually might be. It's quite early in the morning here in Australia and I'm a bit blurry still, but um, thanks for having me. Um, so I'll start off with sort of um, highlighting why I'm interested in this area and why I think it's important um, in research. And this won't come as a surprise to anyone here, I, I imagine, but in um, research, animals are devalued um, and used as, as um, resources. Animals experiences, um, in the research, what they are, um, what are done to them are hidden and it's hard to access that information. Um, it's, it's often hard to access labs and, and research institutions to find out what's happening to animals. Um, the system's opaque in Australia, at least. I know that other, other places like the Europe and the UK is becoming a little bit better, but, um, it's hard in Australia, for instance, to know how many animals are being used um, and you can't get as, ac easy access to ethics applications about what is being done to animals or the number of animals that are um, happening, uh, being impacted. And I think this sort of um, system has set animal research up um, to be insulated from scrutiny and because there's not open and transparent um, conversations and information and data about animal use, it makes it harder to have good critical conversations um, about the about science in uh, animal experimentation. And some of the broad and general justifications for animal use that um, you hear uh, a lot and I'm sure most of you folks have heard before is that animal experiments benefit humans and that's why we need them is uh, um uh, there's plenty of good arguments for why that's not necessarily the case and animal experimentation um isn't all that good uh, and actually has negative negative impacts uh, not just to animals but to humans and the scientific industry um and a less but despite decades of sort of really good research and really good arguments um, on that point, there's not been a whole lot of shifting within the scientific community. Um, and if they don't hit the um, translation, then scientists will often just say, well, at least it adds to knowledge and that knowledge might be useful in the future. We just don't know right now. It's this, you know, this idea within science where it's um, about gathering knowledge about um, about the world. So any knowledge is good knowledge. Um, and I wanted to investigate that side of um, arguments that haven't necessarily been addressed as, as much um, or as often uh, to think about, okay, can we measure how much knowledge is actually gained um, through animal use? What is the cost? And then if we understand what that cost is in terms of animal lives, are we willing to accept that cost? Um, and the other thing that this particular um, question sort of gets at and exposing this particular question um, is it speaks to uh, something that's really important to research as a scientist, which is publication. And that is the currency of, of science. That's how you become a big name. That's how you get funding. It's where you publish. and um, if we can start having conversation about the appropriateness um, of publications uh, with animal use and have that conversation with um, with publishers, journals, then I think we, that's another uh, leverage point, another point of um, discussion that can help open up the, um, the opportunity to criticize and think more deeply about animal use in, in research. So what we did, um, I started a project a couple of years ago now um, that's really trying to think about, okay, centering animals in our research, um, thinking about the animals that are in, in research, um, wanted to investigate the life cost of knowledge creation, uh, advocate for transparency and change at a journal level, um, and go directly to the source. Because the data is often hard to find and hard to get, 
get to. The one place that researchers have to put this information is in their in their publications. You know, so we can find out how many animals, a minimum number of that they've used in their research if we just go directly to the research and read it. Um, so we started a project where, um, yeah, I'm calling animal use in, in research, where we select a relevant journal, um, screen articles for animal use, and then we start to dig in and extract information from those articles um, to quantify the number of animals used, the types of animals, um, species, um, and then extracting more detail on animal experience, because that's something that we've often hidden. And even within the, um, the papers, animals are often just talked about as objects, but you can get some sense of what's happening to them. And I think by um, opening that up, we can start to have uh, some better conversations, um, especially because it's so hard to gain access to uh, research labs to capture footage or other things. Uh, so a couple of years ago, an honor student of mine um, called Maddie Marshall, uh, looked at 15 oncology journals and looked at every paper published within those um, journals that were research articles uh, between 2017, 2018, um, and read through a lot of journals. It was quite sick of it by the end <laughs> and uh, found that 615 of those articles used animals. And she found a minimum use, absolute minimum use, this is, um, of 39,000 plus um, animals used across those 615 animals, uh, 15 um, articles. Um, and a really surprising and interesting uh, outcome that we got from that, uh, that I actually, I, I found quite um, surprising is um, as we were reading, I, I thought, you know, at research, a, a key tenant of research is to make your methods very clear so that your work can be um, repeated um, and people shouldn't have to struggle to repeat your work. And if you, if work isn't repeatable, then, you know, there's an argument that the science is just crap, basically. It's not worth, not worth um, anything. So, um, which is a real problem if you're a scientist. And uh, so as Maddie was reading through these articles, um, they noticed that it was really hard to find how many animals were actually being used. It was in some papers, it was not there at all. So I, I was expecting to just go through and it'd be N equals 52 mice, whatever. Um, but that's absolutely not the case. And that varied and changed between um, journals. And it speaks to this, this issue of transparency and this, um, that the animals are being hidden, even within the research, even though they should be um, it being very clear about it as just a part of good scientific practice. Um, so yeah, 54% of papers, it wasn't, we, we couldn't actually figure out a, 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 couldn't be confident about the number of animals that were being used, which is just wild, I think anyway. It's, it's um, yeah, when I think about science, it shouldn't be like that. And sort of where we are sort of hoping to go with this sort of stuff is to start creating journal-based metrics around animal use to put a little bit of um, transparency about around the implicit um, the implicit support that journals provide for researchers to use animals. And for instance, Cancer Cell is one of the biggest oncology journals in the world. Um, and over the 2017-2018 period, uh, they had 174 articles using animals, 21,000 animals used, 70 Three percent of their articles, we couldn't figure out, um, couldn't be confident about the number of um, animals they're using, which to me just says that there's a real issue within that journal and within that research. The research is is basically useless if it can't be repeated um, transparently. Transparently, um, and the other the other point that we've sort of working towards is if we look at citations. And this is this knowledge creation idea. It's a very crude measure of this. Um, but for every citation that this journal got um, for animal using studies, it costs the lives of 6.14 individuals. Six, in, six individuals were killed to get a citation. And I think if we start to talk about 
animal use in research in that way, we can start to um, have more critical conversations about what we're actually doing and, and what, the, what it's costing and whether we're willing to have that, that conversation, uh, whether we're willing to bear that cost or force animals to bear that cost. Um, we're also doing animal impact stories. So we're extracting the um, specifics around what's happening to individuals and really refocusing on um, and recognizing that these are individuals that are um, being used in these experiments and finding some pretty, as you can imagine, some pretty horrific stories of um, the sorts of things that these, these animals are going through. And just to wrap up um, the pench, uh, sort of thinking about what I, how this sort of relates to advocacy and activists and animal advocates. Um, I think that it starts a conversation with a different um, group stakeholder within the research industry, which is journals, and they can set the trend for things. They could make it a requirement to, um, to include more transparency. And then we can ha actually start to have quest uh, proper conversations um, around the three R's, which are at the moment, it's, yeah, mostly not really discussed. It's sort of um, tokenistic. Uh, we could advocate for more transparent reporting and then build research out from this. So have a big database where we've got all of this information. We know that animals have been used and then we can do further research with that. Um, and thanks for Carl, Carol um, about citizen science. I actually want to turn this into a citizen science project um, and it provides a different form of action for those people who are interested in um, in sort of desktop based activism. Uh, this is a really good option that people could actually screen articles, extract data, and then build up a data set. Um, thanks, for, thanks for your time and feel free to get in touch. Always happy to chat to anyone who's interested in talking about anything to do with animals really. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, that was a really excellent and important um, presentation. Um, that looks like all the time we're going to have for, uh, for that topic until, um, the breakout room that will happen at the end of this session with all the speakers. So, uh, anybody who wants to continue the discussion with Adam, um, keep an eye out for that in a few minutes. Um, next up, we have Dr. Emily Trunnell from People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, who is going to present on funding biases in animal-based research. Take it away, Emily. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to share my presentation now. I just want to, oh, actually, click this. And <clears throat> I just want to confirm. Oh. Of course, my computer is <laughs> freezing up right at this very moment um, instead of, okay. What can you all see? Can you see my presentation? Right now we can just see you. Just see me. That is okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, uh, thanks so much. So I am Emily Trennell with PETA. I'm going to talk a bit today about a project that I've been working on with my colleague, Dr. Kathleen Rowe, um, where we're looking at whether or not there is a, um, a uh, bias towards the use of animal methods in biomedical research funding. So just very quickly about us. So we are in PETA's Science Advancement and Outreach Division, which is fairly new. We just launched in January of 2021. And rather than focusing on specific experiments or specific institutions, our goal is more overall to change scientific paradigms and change policies to move away from experiments on animals. So I think the audience of this symposium um, really understands the ethical reasons why we want to do that, but there are very strong scientific reasons as well as, as Adam alluded to. So for example, less than 10% of discoveries from basic science research end up in entering human clinical use within 20 years. 
More than uh, or 95% of all new drugs fail in human clinical trials. This is after they've been through animal testing and been shown to be safe and effective in animal tests. And the process of getting new therapeutics is extremely time consuming, taking as long as 15 years and up to $2 billion just for one drug. And a lot of the reason for this cost and time is all of these failures are built into the process. So given these really abysmal statistics, why does animal experimentation continue? A major reason for that is because it gets funded. Uh, so we focus a lot on the US National Institutes of Health. They're the largest funder of biomedical research in the world. And they've reported that they spend roughly half of their annual budget on experiments on animals. So last year, half of their budget was about $19 billion. And this is despite those inaccuracies, the expensiveness and, and the failures of, of animal-based methods. So in, in looking at how we can shift funding priorities away from experiments on animals, we're asking who, who are the actual people who approve these projects for funding and what are their potential biases? So to examine that, we look at the NIH grant review process and that's conducted by the Center for Scientific Review at NIH, or, it's called, or CSR. So CSR is divided into a number of what they call review branches, which I, if that text is small on your screen, it's just a name of the review branches. They're pretty much divided uh, between like disease processes. And each of these review branches contains a number of what are called study sections. And study sections are the group of, of individuals that review research grant applications. So these study sections are composed of members of the scientific community. Uh, typically, the criteria to be on an NIH study section is to have received an NIH grant yourself. Um, they, these groups meet about three times per year. There's about 15 to 30 people per meeting. And uh, typically the way it works is that two to three individuals will review a grant application in detail and present that to the larger group at the meeting. And then the study section gives that grant application a score. So the study sections don't actually give the researchers the money, but that score is the most important factor that the Institute that at NIH uses to determine whether or not they're going to fund that grant. So the rosters of these study sections, the, the identities of the people who sit on them are actually publicly available. Most of them are posted right on the NIH website. Some of them you have to submit a FOIA for, um, but they're right there. So we, we wanted to ask, what are the expertise of these study section members? What research do they themselves conduct that might inform their decision making? So to look at that, we used a tool that is on NIH's website also called iSight. Um, and iSight looks at published papers and gives uh, different metrics based on a body of work. So you can enter a specific researcher or you can enter um, a, a list of papers that you've collected and it gives different metrics about citation and other things. Um, we're looking at a lot of different um, metrics, but for this talk specifically, I wanted to focus on uh, one thing. So this is an example of results that you can get on iSight. So I put, um, I just put actually one of the study section members' names in the iSight search engine, and it tells me uh, on one of these tabs that she had 43 publications. And then interestingly, what it can do is it analyzes that body of work from that person and gives an estimate of what proportion of their, um, of their own work was in an animal-based method, a human clinical method, or uh, other molecular or cellular methods. So we, um, we went through the study section rosters um, and we're actually really still at the beginning of this data collection, so I'd love any feedback. But so far, um, we've analyzed eight study sections. There are about 200 in total. We're aiming to do about a quarter of that. Um, but in eight study sections along, among different meeting um, dates, uh, we've analyzed data from about 520 individuals. So we put each of those individuals into the eyesight search engine. Uh, what we found so far is that the expertise of these grant review committees um, can, is about 40% human clinical, about a third in animal-based research, and a little bit less in molecular and cellular techniques. And it's pretty varied when you look at them individually. So this is just, um, these are the 
results from the eight different study sections we've looked at so far. You can see that some of them have a, a ton of more animal-based expertise. We actually chose a lot of clinical, um, uh, clinical study sections to begin with. So I think this is a little bit skewed. I do expect the animal expertise uh, prevalence to go up as we continue to add data, but this is not something that has been examined before. So what, what is the, you know, the people who sit on these grant review committees, what are, what are their own uh, biases that are, um, you know, about their own use and, and what might they be bringing to the table? So next we wanted to know, does the expertise ratio of these study sections translate into the type of grants that they end up funding? Uh, that end up getting funded that they have scored. So okay. uh, for that, we used another tool, which is we actually use a lot at PETA. It's called uh, NIH Reporter, and it's just a database of all of NIH's funded grants. Um, and it allows us to, if you click, this is an example of a results page that I entered for one study section. Um, and if you click on the grant title, it gives you a description of that grant. And so we went through and read these grant descriptions and scored the methods that were used in each grant, whether or not they were human clinical, animal, or other type of non-animal methods, such as organoids or human postmortem tissue, computational modeling, things like that. What we found is that from the, from the study sections we were interested in, over half of the methods funded were uh, used animals, and the, the remaining half was pretty evenly divided between human clinical research and non-animal methods. Again, if you look at them individually, there's a lot of variability. So there were a couple study sections that funded almost, or that scored uh, funded grants that were almost exclusively animal-based methods. Um, so this is just kind of the beginning of our, of our data, but wanting to relate these, these two um, data sets that we've collected, we asked whether or not if a study section has more animal-based expertise, does that correlate with a higher funding of animal-based methods? And we found that there was a very strong correlation. Um, so the more animal methods expertise, the more likely they would fund animal-based methods. Uh, we found a, a, a negative correlation between increased animal methods expertise and funding of uh, clin clinical methods. And um, again, our, our data sets pretty, our N is pretty small right now, but we haven't found much of a correlation yet between the funding of, between the existence of animal methods expertise and the funding of other types of non-animal methods that, that aren't clinical. So those organoids, in vitro methods, computational methods. Um, so this is really just a very small sampling of the, the type of information that we're looking at. We're gonna extend this into many more study sections and look at other metrics that we can collect through eyesight and reporter. Um, and um, that's pretty much all for now. I tried to stay right at time, um, but would love to, to chat more. Any uh, comments, suggestions, uh, reach out to me by email. And our division at PETA, Science Advancement and Outreach, just launched our Twitter this week. So if you're on Twitter, please give us a follow at SAO Science. And thank you so much. Thank you for the really great presentation, Emily. I'm really excited to see uh, the results of this as it progresses. Uh, a question for you. Um, wondering what you think the average uh, animal advocate can do to sort of... Um, uh, kind of help shift uh, those those findings, I guess. Uh, to, to shift the findings to to whether or not these animals. I guess just what role that like the sort of like lay person, I guess, can, can yeah. Kind of play. Um, well, one thing I think is important is is the you know, the existence of these tools to understand what types of research is being conducted because often we don't know. You know, you can read published papers, but as as Adam talked about, the those are. A lot, a lot of times very murky about how much information they contain, um, but there are other ways to figure out what is happening in animal use and what might be leading to those trends. Um, and so eyesight is something that's existed for several years, but, but I only got discovered it maybe a year and a half ago. Um, so just getting these tools out there, and I love the, the idea for citizen science initiatives to be able to collect this data that is otherwise very time consuming. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so that looks like all the time we have uh, for this topic right now. But if you want to continue the discussion, again, please wait 
um, until the end of the session when you can go into a breakout room with all of the speakers uh, from this session. Uh, so next up, we have Janice from the National Canine Research Council, who pre-recorded her presentation on the role of dog behavior on adoption and shelter policies. Um, but uh, please note, Janice will be live for the Q&A um, after presentation or for the breakout room. Um, take it away, Janice. I'm Janice Bradley from the National Canine Research Council. And before I get into the research review I'm here to talk about, I'd like you to just kind of park a couple of, of ideas in the, in the back of your mind. Here's one. Many people involved in rehoming dogs think that we can predict which relationships between people and dogs will end in breakups. The second idea I'd like you to think about is these two dogs, among many possible examples, are often what often be described as bad behavior problems, mental issues that would prevent them from getting along with people. Okay, so now a bit more background. In, in 2014, a book came out called Saving Normal, an insider's revolt against our out-of-control psychiatric diagnosis, DSM-5, Big Pharma, and the medicalization of ordinary life. In it, one of the world's most prominent psychiatrists, Alan Francis, proposed that widespread harm is done by pathologizing normal responses, to the ups and downs in life that we all experience, and stigmatizing them as mental illness. Around the same time, my colleague, Dr. Gary Petronic, and I were exploring what's, what's known about tests called behavior evaluations that are administered to dogs in shelters to determine whether the dogs are fit to live in human homes, basically. We wrote a series of papers about the research on these tests. All three are open access in case you want, you want more detail than I can provide in, in this talk. Our first paper we called No Better Than Flipping a Coin. So you don't have to reach much to get the gist of what we found. It turned out to be statistically impossible for even an implausibly valid and reliable test to tell you much about the future behavior in a home of any individual dog living in a shelter. Our second paper explored the research that's been done on the validity and reliability of these tests with equally unencouraging results. In the third paper, the one I'm presenting today, we challenge the underlying assumption used to justify the use of these behavior evaluations in the first place, and using them particularly on dogs living in shelters. This is the widespread perception that behavioral incompatibilities between dogs and their people are an important factor, sometimes even put forward as the major factor, driving relinquishment of dogs. In other words, that the dogs there have in effect misbehaved their way into shelters. We appropriated Dr. Francis's title, Saving Normal, because it seemed to us to capture our finding that the literature actually revealed nothing that separated dogs living successfully in homes from those living in shelters. The idea that dogs in shelters have behavior problems began to sound to us much like the overdiagnosis of human mental and emotional defects or illnesses that Francis found so objectionable. Our process involved reviews of three groups of studies, compilations of reasons people reported for relinquishing their dogs, risk analyses of those reasons, and finally studies of the prevalence among dogs living successfully in homes of the behaviors reported by the relinquishers. We found 12 studies that surveyed relinquishers. The literature began to emerge in the 1970s. In response to the pressure of pet overpopulation, shelters and researchers began asking people why they were surrendering their pets. One tool for getting a handle on a new and complex problem, which this certainly was at the time, is by reducing the data into categories composed of presumably similar items. But categorizing is often prone to unconscious bias. And ignores differences among reasons by its very nature. So you gotta be sure which eggs you're putting in which basket. We found that when, when the reasons had to do with 
the, the, the pet owners' lives, the circumstances of their lives, they tended to be separated into specific categories. So working too much to have time for the dog was counted separately from lack of access to vet care, which was separated from not having enough money to feed everybody, which was separated from not being able to find housing that allowed dogs, and so on and so on. Each egg going into its own basket as a type of reason. But behavioral reasons tended to be lumped together, however implausibly, as, all, as if they were all one thing. So peeing on the floor typically went into the same basket as chewing up the furniture or barking at the UPS guy. This lumping helped cement the belief that relinquished dogs are behaviorally different from the owned population they come from, even though we found that overall behavioral reasons taken together were less frequent than other reasons taken together. Nine of these 12 studies asked people their reasons for giving up their dogs, but they stopped there. They collected no data on dogs still living in homes with their relationships intact. This means they can't shed any light at all on whether the behaviors reported actually affected the likelihood that a dog would be surrendered to a shelter because risk analysis is a comparative measure. In this case, it would have to be a comparison between behaviors expressed by dogs being relinquished with a convincingly representative sample of dogs living in homes expressing those same behaviors. This has only been done twice, the most recent study having been done more than 20 years ago. There was a third comparative study, but it didn't look at specific behaviors, just at owner satisfaction with the relationship, so it doesn't help us here. It can only tell us about any relationship between owner satisfaction and relinquishment, not what, what it was that the dog did or didn't do. In any case, the only even statistically significant correlation between relinquishment and behavior in the two risk analyses was with elimination in the house, and it was a less than robust finding. In other words, both studies found many dogs living successfully in homes who expressed behaviors cited as reasons by the relinquishing group of owners. Finally, we found and analyzed 14 studies that surveyed owners on their dog's behavior and their own responses to it. This is an image of the narrative table included in the paper. You can look at the open access paper if you want to actually read it. Um, I put it on the slide to show how we included a brief narrative analysis of each paper we found, rather than just including snippets of findings in the text of the paper to support our various points. That's sometimes the way that reviews are done. For each, we looked at the type of sample, how the owners were surveyed, what they were asked, and of course, how they responded. What we found were high levels of incidence of behaviors that the owners considered problematic or that the researchers anticipated that the owners would consider problematic, whether the owners thought so or not, right alongside very high levels of general satisfaction with the relationship, at least in the majority of the studies when that, when that particular query was included. In other words, owners often reported that they didn't much care whether their dogs did this or this or any number of other things from time to time, and certainly not to the extent that they wanted to end the relationship. Turns out bonding and love don't require perfection, and even a few incompatibilities don't necessarily add up to irreconcilable differences. Yet such commonly diagnosed behavior problems can disqualify dogs from being made available for adoption if they happen to find themselves between homes and living in a shelter. These findings call into question policies arising from the twin beliefs that dogs living in shelters are more likely to express behaviors that doctors will find incompatible, no evidence there, with a successful relationship, and the equally unsupported belief that we even know which behaviors are likely to cause a rift in human canine relationships in the first place. If either of these bits of conventional wisdom is actually true, we haven't been able to find any evidence for it. But the resulting policies include delaying adoptions to administer battery tests, futile attempts to suss out specific behaviors that we imagine will lead to failed relationships, and to placing restrictions on which dogs can be adopted and by which people, if any at all. Because we think we can anticipate, again, without evidence, which matchups will stick. This is the often cited fear of the so-called failed adoption, meaning a dog who is returned to the shelter 
which constitute a very small percentage of any adop adoptions in any case. And, and in fact, we now have strong evidence that returned dogs are readopted more quickly than those entering the shelter for the first time. Delaying or even prohibiting adoption can have heavy costs for the dogs and for the shelters. Extending dogs' exposure to the stress of a shelter environment can cause their behavior to genuinely deteriorate. It can reduce the capacity of the shelter and it consumes scarce staff time. This argues for a wholesale reconsideration of the role of dog behavior in placement decisions and of shelter policies that erect barriers to timely adoptions. And now I think we have a bit of time left for some questions. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Thank you so much, Janice, um, who I believe is in here right now. Um, yes, perfect. I am here. Okay, great. Um, question just popped into the chat from Joe. Um, can foster families play a role here in any way? Oh, yes. That's the best, best, best question ever. It's 99% it's probably of the solution. The best, it's an axiom of behavior that the best predictor of future behavior is, is past behavior, but only in the same context. If you want to know how a dog is going to behave in a human home, for heaven's sakes, put him in a human home. You'll find out, you'll find out what's real about the dog and you'll have the, the advantage of built in daily adoption query opportunities because the dog will be out there in the world in normal situations with regular people and people asking about him. So yes, that's my favorite question ever. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Janice. Um, so next up, uh, that's oh, a reminder to everyone that um, we're going to have a breakout room again after the next speaker, um, and then any follow-up questions uh, for Janice, um, feel free to join that breakout room and ask them there. Um, so our next speaker, the last speaker in this session, is Dr. Stephen Shepard from Oklahoma State University, who will be presenting on the public's perception of working animals. Take it away, Stephen. Okay. Um see. There you go. Can you see my screen? Looks okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay. So uh, thanks everyone for being here and thanks for uh, putting this great symposium together. Um, my name is Stephen Shepard. I'm an associate professor of marketing at Oklahoma State University. Um, my training is in social psychology. Um, so using social psychology uh, methods and theories to uh, just understand phenomena and sort of the uh, psychological process uh, behind that. So um, this research is very much in early stages, so uh, I hope that uh, there's still some um, useful and interesting information uh, in here, and uh, I hope to get some good feedback from people and answer any questions that you might have. So um, with this research, um, what I'm interested in is how do people think about animal labor, and more specifically, how might people uh, rationalize um, animal labor exploitation? Um, and so to answer this question, um, I'm mostly mostly relying on theory from uh, some research I was a part of that looked at uh, passion exploitation in human employees. Um, and so in this research, what we find is that when uh, people are passionate about their work, um, and when people perceive a person as being passionate about their job and what they do, um, people basically see it as more okay to exploit them. Now, people don't literally say that, but they see it as more okay to uh, make certain requests of that person, um, to ask them to come in to work unpaid, to do job, uh, jobs that are outside of their, you know, job description, um, and just kind of basically taking advantage of that passion that they have. Okay. Um, you see this in the arts and creative spaces, video game industry, you see it in academia a lot, um, you see it in nonprofits as well, right? Um, all these, uh, contexts where people are you know, kind of passionate about what they do, and because of that passion, um, it could be exploited in different ways and taken advantage of. Um, and what we find is that um, specifically what allows this to happen and what allows people to rationalize um, this behavior is um, this belief that people who are passionate, um, they're intrinsically rewarded um, for 
the job that they're doing and they would volunteer to do it anyway right so if a manager is looking at an employee they would say well they find this work rewarding anyway so i can ask them to do this without extra money or um they would volunteer to do this anyway and they get enjoyment out of it so those are the kinds of things that people can do so anyways that's basically the theoretical lens that I'm bringing to this question, and I'm, I'm wondering if people will engage in a similar process with animals and in the context of animal labor. And I, I think there's reason to think that people do do this, um, certainly in the case of dogs anyway, you see this kind of language come up again and again about, um, you know, the dogs, you know, living for the work that they do, whether it's police dogs or herding um, or whatever. Um, and you see a lot of this language around, you know, the dogs like innate drive and what they're genetically wired to do or bred to do and you see this a lot with um animals and again i think especially dogs um just in general you see this language of well they have these certain traits they're ingrained in them um they are born to do certain things okay and that's sort of the analog here to what i just talked about with with passion in, in humans and human employees so kind of the proposed process um here is uh if certain traits about an animal are kind of particularly salient to people, um, people will see um, the animals being intrinsically motivated to engage in certain behaviors, um, seeing the work as its own reward. You know, the animal finds it fulfilling. They would choose to do this anyway. It's what they would just kind of naturally do. Um, and then that this would lead to um, kind of exploitation. Um, and specifically, we look at we measure that by looking at um, uh, how ethical or unethical people think it is to put the animal in certain situations that might be associated with negative outcomes or, or certain risks. Um, and uh, just generally, whether or not they even see the animal doing these things as exploitative. And so I, I collect data um, from, you know, different places, um, undergraduates, uh, online samples, and um, collected a bunch of data. Um, I'll talk about some of it today. Uh, we have some pilot data just to, just looking at how people even think about animals and labor and do they think employees even a appropriate you know term to refer to animals in different contexts. Um, and then several studies um, that are um, experiments where we um, manipulate the salience of certain traits in the animal. And so in all these experiments, we're looking at dogs specifically and um, in one condition, you know, participants don't get any kind of information that would really make certain traits of the, uh, the animal salient. Um, the other group of people, they would see um, information to suggest that, you know, the, the work that they do is related to kind of innate traits that they already have, um, whether it's kind of like an innate sense of smell or ability to track or things like that. Um, now, none of the, in all these studies, um, the experimental effects are kind of inconsistent. Um, but I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, interesting data here and some interesting relationships that are still um, kind of broadly supportive of um, my uh, hypotheses. So, so just first, just looking at this general question of like, do people think of animals as employees? Do they think that's like a reasonable label for animals? Um, at least in the sample that generally seemed to be the case. Um, so with four being the midpoint on the seven point scale, you can see most of these ratings are above the midpoint um with two exceptions to that so overall like people do seem to think that employee would be like a reasonable label for an animal in different contexts um and people do also seem to think that this would have a benefit to their welfare um i think that when you look across these different contexts um i just try to pick different situations that people may or may not think of animals as employees um I think at least looking at the ratings um, subjectively, you can, I, I feel like where people see it as most appropriate are cases where um, there's a certain amount of uh, the animal would have, uh, would be seen as having innate, you know, traits that are compatible with that work or that they would voluntarily do it. Um, so, you know, the lowest means here are for lab mice. And I don't think anyone would think that lab mice would choose to do that. And I mean, if you have a cat, chances are you probably would intuit that cats uh, probably aren't amenable to uh, being dressed up and photographed or something like that the way that the way the dogs would. So um, in terms of, you know, ratings of motivation, um, just in one of these samples, um, looking at ratings for a German Shepherd police dog, um, again, most of the means uh, or all the means here are above the midpoint 
Um, so generally speaking, people are agreeing with the idea that these dogs, they do what they, they enjoy what they're doing. The work is its own reward. They would choose to do it anyway. They're driven to do it, find it fulfilling, um, things like that. In terms of different situations that they might be put in um, that put them at risk, uh, again, um, the means are generally above the midpoint. Most people saying that it's um, you know, reasonably ethical to have these uh, dogs in different situations, to ask them to uh, you know, take certain risks or put them in dangerous situations, um, put them in situations where they're maybe not getting um, the most uh, enriching emotional lives. Um, um, so yeah, so generally you do see people seeing these things as like reasonably okay. Um, this is just kind of a summary looking at the different uh, sources of uh, data that I have, looking at these ratings of intrinsic motivation, um, ethicality of these different situations, and just ratings of how exploitative is this. Um, and so again, I mean, generally speaking, people see the animals as having this kind of drive, this kind of intrinsic motivation. Um, and in terms of exploitation, again, um, depending on the sample, the, the means are kind of below the midpoint or around the midpoint. So there's kind of uh, some mixed um, reactions there, but certainly no shortage of people who um, see this as not, ex as not exploitation. Um, and I'll get to some data su to suggest why in a, in a second. Um, but speaking to the point of, you know, this link between intrinsic motivation and um, perceptions of exploitation, um, just kind of comparing two of these studies, um, that should say uh, study three at the bottom there at the brown bar, but um, comparing study two to study three, looking at German Shepherds versus another breed of dog that people probably haven't heard of, um, there seems to be differences there in the means where when it's this other breed, uh, Akuvats, that they probably haven't really heard of, um, intrinsic motivation is seen as lower, exploitation is seen as higher. So that might suggest that people don't have the same intuitions about that breed compared to like German Shepherds, which are strongly associated with you know, police work. Um, and so that might speak to this idea again, that when it's seen as having certain traits, um, it's seen as uh, less exploitative. And so further to that point across all these samples, there's pretty strong correlation between perceptions of intrinsic motivation and um, ethicality and perceiving um, less exploitation. So again, the more people see the dog is just driven to do this, it's what they would do anyway. It's fulfilling to them, it's what they kind of live to do. Um, people don't see it as, um, to the extent that people think that, they see it as less exploitative um, and they see it as more ethical. And just kind of visualize what that relationship looks like. Um, if you're um, not used to looking at, you know, Pearson R correlations, this is just kind of a, a visualization of what that data would look like. And so um, again, you can, you can see this, um, you know, pretty clear relationship between intrinsic motivation and um, ethicality. Um, so like I said, this is in early stages, um, hoping to keep building on this, but I think that, um, you know, some early implications of this research, uh, you know, suggest that lots of animals are seen as, people think employees as a reasonable label for animals in different contexts. Um, there's some evidence showing that um, to the extent that the animal finds it fulfilling, or people think the animal finds it fulfilling, or that it has this innate drive to do these things, um, the labor is seen as uh, more ethical and less exploitative. Um, suggested uh, earlier, you know, some differences in perceptions, perhaps based on breed or behavior. Um, so I think that if you, you know, instead of looking at a dog in a certain context, you could look at a cat, people would not have the same intuitions, again, perhaps because of differences in um, intuitions about intrinsic motivation, um, and as a result, intuitions about what is ethical and, and what isn't. Um, I think that this potentially speaks to a psychological barrier um, for advocacy, um, because it, it does represent potentially a means of you know, justifying exploitation um, and perhaps a unique kind of justification or rationalization that isn't really um, explored as much. Um, so there's quite a bit of research on um, the psychology of meat consumption and how people sort of rationalize that. And, and most of that research um, that I'm familiar with deals with dehumanization. So how do we kind of reduce the mind of the animal and deny it a sense of agency or an ability to feel emotion? Um, I think in this case, it's maybe almost the opposite. I mean, people are making a lot of, in order for people to see um, 
you know, this work as being appropriate um, and not exploitative. I'm um, sorry, my dog is coughing in the background. Um, for people not to see it as exploitative, they're, you know, seeing the animals being fully capable of, you know, experiencing positive emotions and, you know, joy and uh, fulfillment, getting fulfillment out of things. Um, and because it's seemingly positive, uh, that's maybe a particularly difficult psychological barrier to to overcome. Um, and just at a more macro level, I, I just think it's interesting, this kind of cyclical process where an animal, like a dog, is bred to perform a certain task, which then allows people to see it as intrinsically driven or, you know, biologically wired to do a certain behavior, which then allows people to see it as okay for the dog to be, or the animal to engage in that behavior and being put in um, certain situations. Um, so that's what I have for today. So thank you very much for your time and um, look forward to the breakout session and any questions or comments that you might have.